All right. As we read through that passage, anything come to mind as you're reading through that? What's your first reaction? Say that again. Thank you for being patient. Good. Karina, what'd you say? Wow. See, I'm the only real cynical one in the room. Because I read through this and I'm like, more? Haven't we covered this before? I mean, it doesn't feel like we've been talking about this covenant and the priests and the new and the old for quite a while now. Yeah, it's been really since chapter 5. And, and what is happening here starting in verse 7, we actually need to go back one verse, all right? Where he says, Jesus has now obtained a superior ministry, and to that degree he is the mediator of a better covenant, which has been established on better promises. Right? What is the author saying right there at the end of verse 6? What do we have in our possession? Not just a covenant. What kind of a covenant? A better one. A new one. And it's with, it is with Jesus. And he's gone on and on about this, despite the, the conversation of the last few chapters, trying to convince his Hebrew readers of this point about the new covenant and the high priest and everything's being done. He feels like he's got to go into it some more, right? We've got this better covenant. We've got these better promises. We have this better mediator. So what was the big deal? Why do you think the author is going through this yet again? Yeah, because we don't get it. We're hard to change. We do not like, when we get an opinion, I don't know if you know this, but when people get an opinion, they stick with it. Whether it's right or wrong. I, I, I'm sure no one in the room has ever gone to the death in battle over something you believe, but not really that strongly. Anyone? Just, just me. Okay. So here's, here's the deal. Remember, who is this author talking to? The Hebrews, who have a whole history. Their identity is focused around Abraham and the covenant and promises that he was given. Everything they do in their life, from the moment they wake up until they go to bed at night, through every season, they are focused on following this covenant and the promises and the history of their people. They are God's chosen people. And then Jesus comes along, and what does Jesus do? Yeah, he, turn, he literally turns over the apple cart, right? He walks into the temple, and he's telling you, you've made this place a den of thieves, and he tells his disciples... I'm changing everything. I'm giving you a brand new command. Now, in our ears, we don't hear much about that. We don't think much about that. Because what is the covenant we know? The new covenant. But he's talking to people who are deeply rooted in that old one. And, and I bet, I started thinking about this. And I'm like, if I were a Hebrew in this day, I may be asking questions like this. What was wrong with the old covenant? And why did God give it to us if it's not working? Why, did, why didn't God just start with the better covenant? Does this mean that God, this will, be, this will mess you up, right? Did God mess up with the first one? Did he blow it? Isn't that kind of what it sounds like though? Right? That one's not working, so I'll give you a new one. And here, cross your fingers, hope to die. This one's going to work better than the old one. Does that sound like God? And if this was his plan, again, if this was his plan all along then, then why didn't he at least tell us how and when and what to expect? Well, that whole thinking is what the author is trying to tackle here. And by the way, before we get on the Hebrews too hard, right? And I know this is going to make some of you mad and I'll get an email and that's okay. We can talk about it. You can take me out to lunch and I'll tell you why you're wrong. Okay. <laughs> What's that? You want to go to lunch? Yeah, Chick-fil-A. All right, let's go. All right, you're buying. Oh, yeah, all of a sudden changed. Yeah, yeah. Not, not on Sunday. They're closed on Sunday. Come on, man. All right, where was I? Oh, yeah, that's it. Yeah, where was I? Right, we hold on to these things, and we're not a lot different. What should every, as a red-blooded American Christian, every judicial building and school in the world should have what plastered on the side of it? 
The Ten Commandments. What is that? That's the Old Covenant. Right? We hold on to it. So that's why the Hebrew is going into this some more. Now, let's talk about that covenant, that faulty covenant. Right? That's how he starts right off at the, at the very beginning, verse 7. For if that first covenant had been faultless, there'd be no reason for a second one. Isn't that what we were just saying? That's part of the problem. If it, but he's turning that argument upside down and saying if it was faultless, if you think that old covenant was fine, then why did God give us a second one? And what's his answer? Because the first one is faulty. Now, it creates this cognitive dissonance in our heads, right? Because who gave us that covenant? God gave us that covenant. Well, why did God give us a broken covenant? Yeah. Yeah. See, he answers that in verse 8. Finding fault with his people. God found fault with his people. See, it's not that the covenant was broken. We're broken. I hate to say this one. We're the problem. Someone should write a song about that. (laughs) Yeah. We are the problem. It turns out I'm the problem. Is it the covenant's problem? No. So what God does, well, let's not get too far ahead of ourselves, right? So what would God do in that case? How does he fix it? He gives us a new covenant. But what was the problem with the first covenant? We are, right? We're the ones at fault. So if God gives us a new covenant, what's still the problem? We are, right? So the, Jeremiah tackles this very question. And the author of Hebrews goes to Jeremiah to unravel this little problem we have. How is God going to solve this problem? If it's not the covenant, it's the people. What's one option? Get rid of the people, Right? In fact, that's such a good option. Guess who tried that first? God did. Hitler was like fifth, sixth, seventh on the list. God did, right? When did God do that? With the flood. He said, people are so evil. They're the problem. Let's get rid of them. But guess what? That didn't solve the problem. Like five minutes after landing on the ground, Noah and his family are sinning again. They are breaking that old covenant. In fact, they're like inventing new ways to break the covenant. So God said, okay, people are the problem. I can't get rid of all of them because it's the people we're worried about. So what is the solution to this problem? Well, let's look at what Jeremiah has to say. By the way, all this, these bold letterings, when you see that in this version, means it's a reference to another verse. This is Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34. See, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel. Okay, when was this being written? Way before the new covenant. This is written, uh, you know, Jeremiah is writing to the exiles exiled Israelites and telling them at some point, God's got you and there's a new thing coming, right? So he's telling us about this new covenant with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah. And it will not be like the, the covenant you have now. It's not going to be like that, that I made with their ancestors on the day I took them by the hand and led them out of the land of Egypt. I showed no concern for them because they did not continue in my covenant. That is a hard sentence. What does that sound like God is saying? You screwed up and I don't care about you anymore. You know what it kind of sounds like? He's saying we didn't keep that covenant and God's justice and righteousness demanded a resolution to that problem. He can't just let it go. For this is the covenant that I made with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws into their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. And each person will not teach his fellow citizen, each his brother or sister, saying, know the Lord, because they will all know me. 
from the least to the greatest of them. For I will forgive their wrongdoing and I will never again remember their sins. That, that's painting an interesting picture, isn't it? But before we get into that new covenant, and by the way, what this shows you is, is this new covenant like something God just dreamt up at the last second? He's like this old covenant, oh man, it's past its expiration date, I better give him a new one. They didn't creep up on God. Back in Jeremiah, what is God saying to his people? There's a new covenant coming because you're broken. You don't keep it and it angers me and I don't want to be angry. I love you and I care about you. I need something to resolve this problem of your brokenness. And that first covenant, let's, let's talk about the first covenant because we'll talk about how things change. That first covenant was a bilateral covenant. You know what that means? Break it apart. What does bi mean? Two, Two. lateral. Side. Two sides, right? There's God's side, and then there's our side. That first covenant, and it, this is all over the Old Testament. If you will obey me and my commands, then I will do this. If you do this, I'll do this, right? If you follow the covenant and follow the rules, there's a blessing. But if you break them, there's a curse. There's a payment that has to be paid for that. Also, the first covenant was transactional, right? At the very beginning. If you do this, now what's the problem? We can't do it, but we try. We try really hard. I mean, that was the Pharisees' real problem, wasn't it? They tried really hard. They were doing their best. They're like, look, 10's not enough. Let's make 7,000 rules. Then we can write a book and get publishing rights and all that stuff which is pretty much exactly what they did. God says, I'm going to create a brand new covenant that is not like that old one. So we should not expect that it's like that old old one, right? And then he talks about, okay, so what are the differences? What makes this new covenant so good? And he gives us three reasons, right? He starts right there at 10. He says, "This, this covenant that I'm going to make with the house of Israel, first of all, I will put my laws into their minds and I will write them on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. The first thing about this new covenant is, it's uh, it's personal. Where is he going to write his law? In our hearts, right? It's a very personal thing. How did the old covenant work? It went through a priest, it went through an earthly mediator, right? You didn't go to God. It wasn't personal. Nothing was written on your heart. God says, I'm going to move this from being an external thing and it's going deep inside of you. I'm going to put it in your mind, your thought process and your feelings deep down into your heart. This is going to be very personal. It's also, the second thing is this new covenant is relational. He will be our God and we will be his people. And it says, look, we're going to We're not just going to know about him. We're going to know him. And he's saying, there's a day in this room, I can look around at the people I know. I don't have to ask, do you know the Lord? You do. I know you do. Right? And there's coming a day when we're going to look around at everyone we see. We don't have to ask, do you know God? Do you know Jesus? Is he your Lord and Savior? Because everybody is going to know, he says, Because it's personal. Remember, we're going back to the Garden of Eden. That's what that was God's original plan before we messed it all up. With the help of that snake, remember they're cursed by God. It's in the Bible. Okay. (laughs) Right? He's trying to get us back to that moment. And what did Adam and Eve do with God? They walked with him in the cool of the garden. They had a relationship with him. It was personal and it was relational. And he's saying, I want to get back to that. But this old covenant is not relational, right? It's transactional. Follow the rules. And then thirdly, it is forgiving right there at the end. I will forgive their wrongdoing and I will never again remember their sins. The new covenant is about forgiveness. But how is that forgiveness bought? With the blood of Christ. Okay, now you may get to this point like I did and go, okay, I got it. 
That sounds like the gospel. That, anything there that makes anyone go, yeah, I don't, I don't understand that. We know that it's personal, right? We know that it's relational. We know that it's forgiving. Why do we know that? Because we've lived with this. We know it's better because we've experienced it. So what do we do with this? We know all of this. So pastor, good luck making an application. Give me a shot, all right? Let me ask this. We're going to do a little history. How many of you know what this is? This picture that he's going to put up in a second and it's going to be like, bam, right there. How many of you know what that is? It's a stick shift. How many of you can drive one? Now, leave your hands up. How many of you that can drive one who are under the age of 50, put your hands down. Under the age of 50. Wow, how about... No, if you are under 50, put your hand down. If you're over 50, keep it up. And you can drive a stick. Yeah, okay, good. That makes more sense. Well, why doesn't everyone in the room... By the way, what's the next one? I think I got a different picture of one. Right? Well, what's that thing on the left? The clutch. Do you guys know how to drive a stick? Yeah? You got good parents. Good people have been doing, doing right things, all right? That one on the left, that's called the clutch for those of you who don't know how to drive it, right? All right? How many of you know what this one is? That's an automatic, right? How many of you can drive those? Right. Anyone who can drive can drive one of these, right? So here's the big question. Manual or transmission? Show the next slide there. Yeah, automatic or manual transmission? How many say manual is the best? Okay, how many say automatic is the best? How many of you are like, you're just standing in the way of getting to lunch? <laughs> this is a dumb question, right? No, okay, let's go back to the manual. Where's my manuals? Why is it better? It's fun. What's that? If you can drive manual, you can drive anything. That's true. But what if we got rid of all the manuals? Then anyone could drive. Oh, it's boring. All right, why else do you prefer the stick shift? You can go faster. More control. You can save your brakes. All right, anyone know about NASCAR? Yeah. All right, NASCAR automatic or manual? You're like, we don't know. <laughs> it's manual. How about F1? It's automatic, right? Which is faster? Yeah, they use paddle shifters so the computer's not making the decision, but there's no clutch. You pull it and you just go. So yeah, it's kind of a hybrid, right? Uh, why aren't all cars manual if it's so much better? Because you have a choice. Ease, right? It's easier. What does it take to learn how to do this? This is what it takes. Right, go. If you if you're taking someone to learn to drive a manual, bring a neck collar with you, and put it on before you go out. Don't. It's not for later. It's to prevent whiplash. Right. I think my dad taught me how to drive manual the best way of all. Right. He taught me on a on an automatic, and then he threw me the keys one day and said, "Go drive around the block in our neighborhood in the manual until you know how to do it." I said, "Aren't you coming with me?" He said, "No." And do not come back until you know how to do it, right? And, and first of all, it, that works because it's embarrassing at first, isn't it? How many of you remember that first big hill? Right? And, and when you're new at it, what invariably happens? Someone gets right on your tail. I mean, just like, you're like, don't you know I'm a student driver? And their answer would be, no. No. Right? It's a terrifying moment. I think more clutches have been burned out on that mode than anything else, right? This, is a, this question of automatic versus manual is the very question the author is dealing with here. Because we cling to the old. Is manual better? No. No. It's not better. Now, it may be more effective at certain things. But it's not better. If you've driven with it, oh, you don't have to think. I mean, you go across the miles and miles. You're in stop and go traffic. You're in stop and go traffic with a manual transmission. 
Oh, it's terrible. You got, you got your foot's cramping up, right? Yeah, it's not good. Now, let me ask you the question. Is the manual transmission in and of itself a bad thing? No. Is the automatic like the be-all, end-all of transmissions? No, but it's better. Right? What percentage of cars do you think today are sold with an automatic versus a manual? What a huge number. Right? Ask Google and it'll lie to you. But you know what, 90, 10? 90, 10 is probably something like that. Why would the car manufacturers go 90, 10 over something that was better, worse? Right? They know what sells. You can tell me you want a manual, but I bet you've got an automatic. Right? Here's the thing. There's nothing wrong with... What makes the automatic better than the manual transmission? What's the one thing it does that makes it better? Oh, he's saying it. Say it louder. It doesn't depend on us to do shipping. It doesn't depend on us. Right? Isn't that the problem with the manual transmission? We're the problem. And if you don't believe me, take someone who doesn't know how to drive a manual and find out. It's not the manual transmission because I can get in the driver's seat and drive perfectly fine. Right? Well, as far as you know. But you take someone who's never done it, it takes, it, it's bilateral, it's transactional. You have to know how to do the clutch. You have to know where the gears are, when to do the clutch, when to do the gear, how to let it out, how fast, how slow, right? All of that, there's a lot of finesse into it, and it's hard for us to learn that stuff. That's the old covenant. There's nothing wrong with the covenant. It's us trying to utilize it. We can't do it. And the automatic is, is this, better, this better thing. And it's not that the old was bad to begin with. What is the new covenant taking out of the equation? Us. And it's putting in our place Jesus Christ. It's putting Jesus in our spot. Saying, you don't know how to follow the old covenant, so I will. You are broken and I'm perfect. Jesus is saying, I'm replacing you with me. And when we get to the heavenly gates and we're standing in heaven, it's not a book with your name. Well, it is a book with your name written in it. <laughs> Can't say that. Yeah. But how your name got in that book, God is going to look and is going to see his son, Jesus Christ. And that's going to get you access. Not the things you did. You, Here's what happens differently in this new covenant. You do those old covenant things because of what Jesus has done for you and the power of the Holy Spirit. It's not you, it's him. You see the difference? In fact, he says it right here. By saying a new covenant, he's declared that the first is obsolete. And what is obsolete and growing old is about to pass away. He's saying the, the old is obsolete. That's, they don't make them anymore. And we in our nostalgia go, why not? Because there's something better. Right? We should be excited about that. Here's the bottom line. I wrote this down so I wouldn't forget it. Our sinful nature demands that we earn our salvation. We want to earn it. Right? Right? That's the old covenant, but it turns out that we were the problem, so God removed us from the equation and gave us a new commandment based on what he did, not on what we do. And someone said it earlier, so what is our takeaway today? Jesus, take the wheel. That's what we want. Jesus, you run this thing. You drive this car. You lead and direct me. That's what the new covenant gives us. So that's what I'm calling you all to do. Let's, let's pray. We're going to have some announcements and then you're going to be dismissed. Father, we thank you for this beautiful day that you've given us. Thank you for the new covenant that makes the obsolete old covenant outdated. You've given us something. You've taken us out of the equation and given us your son so that we can follow this new covenant to love you with everything that we are and everything that we have and everything we believe and to love and care for our brothers and sisters and the people that need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Father, let us cling to this new covenant knowing that it enables us to do everything that the old covenant was attempting to get us to do, 
But instead of being transactional, it is personal and it is relational and it offers us your forgiveness. And all God's people said, amen. All right, we got some.